So firstly, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you for volunteering to do a watch. It's really exciting. Um, as we've just introduced ourselves, I'm Claudia, and then we've got Katie here with us, who will be monitoring the chat um, and just asking, answering any questions you can through the chat. Um, but there will be a question answer session a bit later. Um, just a quick, quick bit of housekeeping. There is a dog here, so if you hear any weird noises, it's not coming from us. Um, it's coming from our Sea Watch mascot. Um, we're also going to have a 10 minute break in the middle of the session, so you will have time to make a cup of tea, go to the loo, or whatever you need to do. But let's get started. So the first part of the training we'll be doing is looking into our forms. So our land watch and boat watch protocols. Um, so we'll be doing a bit about the forms, how to fill them in, what to expect, um, what sort of information you need to include, and how to get that information. So if my computer wants to work with me, the things you need to look out for when you're looking at cetaceans um, and noting down what species they are is their overall size, the head shape, presence and length of the beak, the dorsal fin, the spout, the coloration patterns and skin marks. So unfortunately, most of the time your sightings will be quite brief. Um, it is very rare that you'll get an incredibly long, beautiful sighting where you have lots of time to identify the animals. So just be aware that it can be quite brief. So just make sure you're taking note of all these different things, um, which will help you identify the species a bit easier. And we will be going over different species a bit later. So we'll do that after the break so that um, we can touch more about what different species we're expecting to see and how to identify those. Oh, my computer has been very slow at switching slides. So obviously we've got two different types of data that we collect. The first one being our casual sighting. So this is when you might just be strolling along the seafront and see a cetacean and you pop it onto our website or send us the sighting. While these are really, really great and they can provide some really useful information, they are not quite as valuable as what we call a systematic watch. So this is when we record the amount of timing, the amount of time we spend observing the dolphins or the animals, um, as well as taking effort. So things like our environmental data, um, sea states, visibility, all sorts of things like that. It is also really important um, to note that no sightings are just as important as having sightings. Um, I know this can sometimes seem about counterintuitive, but we need to know where the animals aren't, um, and it helps us to establish sighting rates, especially when we are recording the effort data too. It makes it a bit easier for us. Um, so yeah, if you've got no sightings, it does not mean you've had an unsuccessful watch. This is just as important to us as having hundreds of dolphins during your watch. So please don't worry about this. What do we need to bring on a watch? This might seem quite straightforward, um, but we just like to make sure that you are aware of what equipment will be required. Obviously not all of these things are vital, um, but we do recommend having binoculars. This just obviously helps us to see animals a little bit further away. And this can help us better identify them if we can get a slightly closer view. A wristwatch or a smartphone. And this just helps with keeping track of when you are recording effort. So we tend to record effort every 15 minutes. Um, but I will go through that with you when we go through the forms. A pen or a pencil, um, again, just to write on your forms. So that's quite straightforward. The forms themselves. Um, so we can either we can either download these forms from the website or we can post them to you. Um, or we can email them to you for, the, for you to print them off yourselves. If you want us to post them or email them, just drop myself or Katie an email and we can get these to you as soon as possible. Next thing would be a digital camera. This is not hugely important if you don't have one. Um, this can just prove quite useful for our social media, as well as doing things like photo identification. So it can be quite handy from that point of view. But again, not a vital piece of equipment. Uh, waterproofs and warm layers. If the weather's going to be anything like it has been the last few days, very unnecessary. Um, so yeah, just judge the weather. It's always good to bring layers with you just in case. It's something we train into our interns over here. Uh, sunglasses um, and sunscreen. Obviously, if the weather's going to be as nice as it has been, please make sure you are looking after yourselves um, and just be careful of the sun. And lastly, plenty of water. Um, don't forget to drink. I know sometimes if you're on a watch for four hours, you might be put off drinking plenty of water because you might need the loo. Please don't do this. Um, it is very important to stay hydrated. We don't want anyone getting unwell while out doing watches. 
So we'll go over the forms now. Um, first form being our land-based effort recording form. So I've just realized this is not in the best quality, um, but we can send these over to you guys so you do have access to them yourselves. So we start off by recording our date. So day, month, year, quite straightforward. Our site name. So we tend to record our site name with um, place, comma, county. So it just makes it a bit easier for us um, to keep everything consistent, especially when we're putting them on the website. Latitude and longitude, if you aren't able to get these for us, don't stress. Um, we're able to find this ourselves. Um, as long as we have your site name, it's not too difficult for us to sort that out. Same with west and east. Um, don't worry too much about that part, as long as we've got the site name. Next, we've got the observer names. That would just be your name, as well as your address. That's just so we keep in touch um, about your sighting. Address isn't, again, too important as long as we have a contact email or a contact phone number. So that's just the, the straightforward um, admin side of things. So the form itself, we record effort every 15 minutes, um, usually over a two hour period. However, you can do it for longer or for shorter, whatever suits you best. So our start time would always or be whatever time you choose to start. So for example, if we started at 7 p.m., the start time for the first line of effort would be 7 p.m. or 1900 hours. And the end time would be 1915 or 715. So that's our first line of effort. First thing we record is our C state. Um, I will go over C state with you once you've gone through the forms. Next thing would be our swell height, our wind direction and our visibility. So again, we'll go through swell height with you. In terms of wind direction, we record the direction that the wind is coming from, not the direction that the wind is coming to. If you're ever unsure, it can just be easier to look online um, using websites like XC Weather. It can be a bit easier to judge the wind from that because I know it can be a bit tricky when you're out in the field trying to figure out where the wind is going. Visibility I'll cover in a, in a moment. So additional notes, this can be quite important. Um, what boats you're seeing, if there's hundreds of boats worth noting them down, um, anything noteworthy that happens, maybe it starts raining halfway through your watch, um, just things like that, just little bits of extra information that can be quite useful for us. So if you've had a great watch and you've had a, sorry, just letting someone into the, the, into the meeting, <laughs> sorry, losing my words. Um, so next thing we have to do is if we've had a fantastic watch and we've seen loads of animals, um, we fill in our sightings. So the top part of the form is obviously your effort side, and the bottom part is where we have sightings. The first column we have is first seen, so when was the animal first observed, and last seen, when was the animal last observed. Next thing we have, I can't even read that, species. thank you, is our species. Again, I will go over species identification with you a little bit later on. Next we have is confidence, so how confident are you that that is the species that you believe it is not a problem if you're not hugely confident. So we use definite, possible, and probable. So definite being the most confident, probable being middle level of confidence, and possible being least confident. Um, if you're ever unsure about a species identification, feel free to just drop us an email. We can have a look um, at how you describe the animal and we can take it from there. Group size, how many did you see? Number of calves, number of juveniles. We will go through how we can determine calves, juveniles, and adults, again, a bit later. Um, so it makes it a bit easier. Bearing, so where was the animal based in compar comparison to you? Distance, how far away was the animal? Um, guesstimates are absolutely fine. Um, I know it can be a bit challenging. Personally, distance measurements is my biggest weakness. So <laughs> we do understand that. Behavior, um, what was the animal doing? Um, we'll touch on behavior again in a bit, and associated seabirds. So it's sometimes really interesting if there are hundreds of gannets diving around dolphins, um, it just helps us understand behavior a bit more and as well as those interactions between the birds and the cetaceans. So that is our land-based effort recording form. We'll move on to our vessel. So the vessel recording forms are broken up into two different parts, the first one being effort, and the second one being sightings. So we'll cover the first one, the effort-based one first. Very similar to the land watch form, we've got our date. Vessel, so the name of the vessel. Contact name and address. Telephone and email. 
observer name, so who was on board, who was involved in the observation or in the watch. Um, it's sometimes nice to include those people um, so we can give them a bit of a mention when we do have really exciting sightings. So again, same as with Landwatch, we do record effort every 15 minutes. And we need to make sure we know whether it is in GMT or BST. So we are currently in British summertime. So just normal circling of that one is quite simple. It just helps us when we input our data to make sure that everything is consistent. First thing we're going to record is our latitude. So this we, rec we measure in degrees, decimals, minutes, and then our longitude. So degrees, decimal, minutes. When you're on the boat, it, can, well, it is quite important to record our latitude and longitude um, because it helps us determine exactly where you are and what route you're taking so we can map out the route of the boat. Next thing we have is the boat course. What direction is the boat going? You will be able to find this all on a standard GPS, um, which you can also download onto your phone. You can get an app for this, um, which we can send around if you would like. Speed, how fast is the boat going? Effort type. So these will generally be casual watches um, with you guys on board. When you are with the dolphins or looking for dolphins, it'll be dedicated search, but generally, almost always, it'll be a casual watch. Next thing we have is sea state, swell height visibility, same as the land watch form. Um, and we'll go over how to measure all of that in a moment. Then we have boat activity. So what other boats are out there? There is a key at the bottom that tells you everything you need to know about the um, acronyms that we use for the different boats. So if you get stuck with that, just have a look. Um, it's rather that than me going through each of the boats and expecting you to remember them. So do use the key. It is very, very helpful. And lastly, we have the sightings reference. So if you do have a sighting, it is really handy to put the sightings reference in so we know where the sighting lines up with um, in terms of the line of effort. So we can just work it out that way. The next thing we have is our vessel based sightings form, very similar. So we've got our sightings reference number. So you'll start at one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. The time of the sighting, the location, latitude and longitude, if possible. If not, a estimate of where you are is good enough. That's absolutely fine. We know sometimes when you've got a sighting, it can be a bit stressful to be monitoring the sighting as well as recording the location. So if you aren't able to do it, not a problem. Species, confidence. So again, this is the same we spoke about before. How confident are you in the sighting? Total number, number of calves, number of juveniles. Bearing to animal. So where was the animal in relation to yourself in terms of um, degrees? So again, we can send out details of how to measure that. Distance to the animal, how far away was it? Behavior, what was the animal doing? Reaction, so did the animal react to the boat? Um, this, we have three different versions or two, three, three different options even. Towards, the animal came towards the boat. Away, the animal swam away from the boat or none. It, the animal just wasn't really bothered by what was going on. Animal heading, was the animal heading a specific direction? Um, if so, note that down. We just note that down in Northeast, South and West. Um, so quite easy to do in terms of that. Associated seabirds, again, similar to our land watch form. Um, what seabirds are around? Are they associating with the animals? Um, again, really interesting to see those interactions. And the observer name, so who actually saw the sighting. Um, yeah, really handy to have that. Also, if someone's unsure about a sighting, they put it down as possible or probable, it can be handy for us to get back in touch with the observer um, and just get them to describe the sighting a bit more. So aside from using our forms, we do obviously also have our Sea Watcher app, which is free to download. Um, and you can do your surveys on the app itself, so you don't have to worry about writing things down. And um, the great thing about the app is it is able to recognize your latitude, longitude, etc. So you have to worry about noting that down. Um, so it can be really handy from that point of view, especially if you're on the boat. So we do recommend using that. Um, I believe there is a video showing exactly how to use the app on our social media. Um, so just take a look for that or we can send the link out after this, this meeting. So it is, yeah, like I said, really, really handy to use. We do recommend using it. Um, it makes your life a lot easier in terms of collecting the data. So going through some of the things that we are looking for. 
we'll start off with C state. So we measure our C state in the Beaufort scale. Um, so this essentially just measures wind speed and is based on an observation rather than a really accurate measurement. Um, so we generally measure from zero to three, sometimes four, but we tend to stop recording once it hits a C state four because it can be too difficult to observe the animals at that point. So we've got C state zero, which is the first image over here, which is when the sea is like a mirror, no wind, it's very, very calm. And then we've got C state one, um, slight ripples, it, water looks a bit like scales, there's a little bit of wind in the air, um, but otherwise very still. C state two, there's a light breeze, small wavelets, more pronounced than C state one, but they don't break. Then we've got C state three, where we've got a gentle breeze, large wavelets, crests begin to break, and there are white caps present. Next thing we're measuring is our swell height. So the swell is this area of the waves. Um, so we measure our swell height in three different measurements, light, moderate, and heavy. So we tend to only be out on the boat, only out recording data in a light, and the reason for this being if the swell height is more than that, we generally won't be able to, to observe the animals um, and it makes our data a bit more inconsistent. Um, so yeah, that is swell height, really simple to again to measure. We're just looking at that space between the waves. Next thing we're noting down is our visibility. So we measure four different types of visibility. The first one's not mentioned in this in the slide itself because it is less than one kilometer. Um, that's really bad visibility. And normally we would call off a watch at that point. But if you're feeling really committed or if you have sightings, feel free to carry on with it. That is not a problem. So we have one to five kilometers, moderate, not the greatest of visibilities, but we can deal with it. Six to 10 kilometers, this is quite decent visibility. We can see quite far out, which is fantastic for our watches. And then we have anything over 10 kilometers. This is really good. This is the ideal condition. We know we can see clearly for quite a distance and we'll be able to observe animals that are quite far out, especially while using our binoculars. So next thing we'll be looking at is animal behavior. So this is really important to, to note and it is important to watch the animals for a short period of time before you actually assess or note down the behavior. This is because the animals might be exhibiting more than one behavior and we tend to note down the behavior that's more prevalent. So they might be traveling, but they might also be feeding at the same time. If they're traveling more frequently than feeding, we would rather note down traveling. And so that is really important to note. Just observe them for a little while, see exactly what they're doing and then note down the behavior. So another thing that we note is the direction of travel. When the cetaceans are traveling in a sustained manner in a particular direction, then we record the direction of the movement. If the cetaceans are swimming all over the place, um, we don't really have a set direction. So we'll just write down variable um, because they have no set location or set destination. So there's no really real way for us to figure out the exact direction of movement. Breaking down a few of the behaviors. First one being traveling. So this is when the movement is persistent and directional with a regular dive pattern of surfacing and diving, dive angles are shallow, animals are not underwater for an extended period of time. So it's quite clear when they are traveling that they are trying to get somewhere. Um, it is easy to notice because they will all be traveling in the exact same direction. We then have three different types of swimming that comes within traveling. Our slow swim, this is when they're swimming less than three knots. Normal swim, this is the behavior we see most frequently, which is when the animals are traveling three to six knots. And fast swim, so this is also known as porpoising, when the animals are moving quite fast through the water, generally on a mission to get somewhere um, quite quickly. Feeding, so this is when the animals are feeding, obviously, and they will be moving in all different directions. They'll be diving quite swiftly. You'll often see uh, movement at the surface. And that's normally when the animals are chasing a fish. Um, we will only class behavior as feeding if we see the animal directly pursuing a fish or with the fish in its mouth. 
if the animal does not show a fish or if you cannot see the fish, we will put it down as suspected feeding. Um, it's very similar behaviors. Obviously, we cannot be 100% sure that the animals are feeding because the behavior sometimes exhibited in feeding does look quite similar to your behaviors exhibited in socializing. So we prefer to see the fish um, if we're going to note the, the behavior is feeding, otherwise sus suspected feeding. It's also important to note that baleen whales may lunge feed, so this can be a bit more obvious um, than watching the animals feed at the surface. So the next behavior we have is leaping and breaching. Um, I didn't really put a description down for this because I feel like it's just in the name. Um, this is when the animal's full body leaves the water. And this is normally done when they're socializing or when they just have bursts of energy. It is an incredible thing to witness. If you have seen it before, it is my favorite behavior that the cetaceans exhibit. We've then got socializing. The animals will normally be in close proximity, showing high levels of interaction, touching each other, rubbing their bodies, swimming belly to belly. Um, it's quite obvious when the animals are socializing, um, there's a lot of splashing, a lot of leaping. The fins and flukes will often break the surface of the water and there will be frequent aerial behavior, like I've just mentioned. If you're able to, it can be really great to note down a further step um, as to what the behavior or what the socializing is, whether it's sexual behavior, aggression, or just being playful. Um, that's sometimes really great information for us to have. It can be challenging, obviously, to tell the difference, especially when you're observing from land. Um, but if you are able to, fantastic. The more information we have, the better. We've then got resting and milling. This can sometimes look very, very similar to traveling or to slow swimming, um, but their movement is very slow and with no obvious direction. They will swim in very close proximity, but they will not be interacting. So they'll just swim closely together, but they won't be touching each other. And the activity levels are obviously very low because they are resting themselves. And they will sink, they'll surface in a very synchronized manner and spend most of the time quite close to the surface. So it can be, like I said, a bit tricky to tell the difference between resting and slow swimming. That's why it's really important to observe the animals for a little while, um, just to determine exactly what they're doing. Surfacing, again, quite straightforward. Um, this is when the animals are coming to the surface quite regularly, but not necessarily traveling in any direction. Um, they're just surfacing frequently. They can do this for a number of different reasons. Um, yeah just making sure that they are not traveling any set way and they are just surfacing and that is what we would record. Next two behaviors we have are blow and spy hop. So again, these are our two examples. We have blow, just when you see the mist coming up from the animal itself and spy hop. This is something we see mostly in orcas and killer, or killer whales. Um, and that is when they just sit at the surface like this. Our next two behaviors that we have are tail slap and bow ride. So tail slap can either be a sign of aggression or a sign of socializing or playfulness. And we often see it when mothers try to communicate with calves. Um, so tail slaps can be done if the animal has been approached by a boat too closely, or if the calf or other dolphins are doing something that that dolphin is not happy with. Um, it is a, just a way that they communicate. But again, it can be done just out of excitement. The next thing we see is bow riding. Um, this is also incredible to see. Um, dolphins do this because they enjoy the force of the slipstream that is produced by the boats and they enjoy playing in the bow wake um, of the boat itself. So they do just do that for fun, really. So next thing we'll be looking at is our group size and composition. Obviously, there's all different group sizes and compositions you can find um, being from calves, to, to adults, to having maternity pods, to having juvenile pods. Um, it is, can be difficult to determine the difference, especially between juveniles, calves, and newborns. Um, but an example would be that with a juvenile, they would normally be swimming independent, independently, but they would be associated with an adult. So they would never really be on their own. Um, there will be an adult somewhere nearby. They're generally about two thirds to three quarters the size of an adult. Um, so it's really handy if there is an adult present to be able to see exactly the size difference. The next one we have is our calves. So these are generally about half the size of an adult and they're generally being consistently escorted. So they're not attached to the mother's hip. 
but the mother is always present or another caretaker is always present around them just to make sure that they're doing okay. And the last we have is our newborn. These are generally around half the size of an adult and they will surface with an adult and they will be alongside an adult the whole time you're observing. And often, um, actually most of the time, you will be able to see fetal folds as well as just the fetal markings on the dolphin itself. So that's again, why binoculars are really important to be able to see that detail. So what we'll do is before the next part of the presentation, which is looking at um, species ID, we'll take a quick break um, and we'll meet back about 22.8. Oh, just skipping ahead now. Um, so if you just wanna take a break, go to the loo, make a cup of coffee and we'll meet back in a bit.
Hello, we're back. Um, I hope you had a good break and have a nice cup of tea with you now. Um, the next part of the presentation of the training, we're going to be focusing on cetacean species identification. So we'll be covering a bit more in terms of that. Um, I'm sure many of you are um, quite experienced observers and do know what you're doing, um, but it is sometimes handy to go over these things. So we'll start off with the harbor porpoise. So the harbor porpoise has a triangular dorsal fin, a small flat head. They are the smallest cetacean in the UK and they are generally quite a shy species. So we won't tend to see them um, coming up to boats or interacting with boats. They'll tend to swim away um, and avoid contact at all costs. Their belly is white and they do have a paler patch up by the flanks in front of the dorsal fin, as you can see in the bottom picture. In bright sunlight, they can sometimes appear to be brown rather than gray. And when they surface, their blow can often be heard, which is why they've been given the nickname the puffing pig. So they are quite a sweet species and they are a species that we do see quite often. Um, so they're always great, very adorable. Our next species is the bottlenose dolphin. Um, these are quite distinct and they're generally the most well-recognized um, species in the UK in terms of cetacean species. So the most distinct part of the bottlenose dolphin is their sickle-shaped dorsal fin, um, which is quite easy to identify, as well as a distinct rostrum, which is why they have the name bottlenose dolphin. Um, their nose is quite protruding and quite easy to see from that point of view. They have a dark coloring on the top half and a light belly. Um, but they generally don't have any other markings. Bottlenose dolphins are quite robust and um, they're quite large animals, um, much larger in the UK than they are elsewhere in the world. This is because of our cold waters. Um, and we'll see them all over the UK. So we'll often find our dolphins from here in Cardigan Bay do travel around the UK. So we'll sometimes see our animals up in North Wales, Scotland, those sorts of areas. So they are very, very well distributed. And there are species that we're expecting to see quite a lot over National Whale and Dolphin Watch. So for some reason, the slide has decided to put a transition in without me realizing. So we have our minke whale, which is obviously one of the most um, well-observed whales in the UK. Um, it has a tall dorsal fin, which is sickle-shaped and situated nearly two thirds along the back. Its head and body are dark gray to black, um, but with a gray area on the flanks and a diagonal white band on their flippers, which we can see in this bottom right photo. We can see the white patches there. They do have a relatively small fin um, and their blow tends to diffuse and is not often very visible. So you generally won't see the minke whales blow. Um, it'll generally blend into the air around it. We then got the white beaked dolphin. So these have a tall recurved dorsal fin. So it is quite a distinct dorsal fin. They are black above. So the top half of them is black with white on their flanks and all over their back. So we do have this patch here, which is carries on being black. The rest of them is white. They're quite a large species and do grow up to over four meters. Um, they are very robust and they can sometimes show up to 26 different color pattern components. Um, so they can vary quite distinctly. And notably, they don't always have a white beak. So don't rely on that as your identifying point. As you can see in this image here, this animal does have a black beak. So something to be aware of. The next species we have is the humpback whale. So you will find there is a hump before the dorsal fin. For some reason, I didn't think to include that as an image. Um, they are the most distinctive baleen whales. So they're quite easy to identify. And they have large white pectoral fins which has actually given them um, a nickname, which I cannot remember now. I thought I had it written down, um, but they are known quite well for their, their white pectoral fins. They have a knobbly head, as can be seen in this top image, and quite a bushy blow. So their blow is very, very distinctive. We've then got our common dolphin. These are quite small and slender animals, um, often mistaken for bottlenose dolphins, um, people often think, or the other way around, 
people often think that a bottlenose dolphin is referred to a com as a common dolphin because they are the most commonly seen dolphins. Please don't get these mixed up. They are very, very different. Um, they are much smaller than the bottlenose dolphin. They have an hourglass coloration with tan at the front and gray on the back. So the coloration is really beautiful and quite distinctive. And they are social and active at the surface. They're also known to interact quite well with boats. So often you'll get large pods joining boats, bow riding, um, and so on and so forth. They also form, like I just mentioned, um, large groups. So they will generally be seen in quite large pods um, and not often observed on their own. They are a very agile species. We'll often see them jumping out of the water, doing a lot of aerial behavior and bow riding. They can be a really fun species to observe because they do interact quite a bit with boats as well as with each other. The next species we have is our Rousseau's dolphin. This is personally my favorite cetacean species, despite the fact that I've never actually seen one. Um, they're top of my list of cetaceans to see. So they do have a tall skinny dorsal fin, which is observed in this photo. The adults do show extensive white scarring, which we can see here. However, they are born gray, so they don't have the scarring and they do have quite a bulbous head. And so interesting update, um, this photo at the top was actually taken in Cardigan Bay um, about a week back where our interns were on survey and came across a pod of Rissos, which is quite rare, rare around here. Um, unfortunately, I was not on board, so I was not particularly happy about that, um, but happy for them. So yeah, really cool species. Um, again, really distinct from their dorsal fin can often be confused with an orca, um, so just be aware and look for the coloration of the animal itself. The next animal we have is the fin whale. Um, they have a very slender body, which means that they are one of the fastest cetaceans and they can reach speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour, which is quite impressive considering their size. Their lower right side of their jaw is white, which you can kind of see in this photo. And they have V-shaped chevrons on the back and behind their head which again, you can sort of see in this. Um, we do have possibly clearer photos on our website for species identification if you do need them. We've then got our say whale. These are mostly dark gray with white on their belly. The back is often mottled with scars, which isn't hugely clear from this photo. And they do have quite a high, three meter high vertical bushy blow. So they can be quite easily identified from the blow itself. We've then got our Atlantic white-sided dolphin. Again, really, really beautiful species. Um, they've got a sloping head with a short, thick black beak. Um, the large, often erect, strongly sickle-shaped dorsal fin is centrally placed. This is normally larger in the males than it is the females, so don't rely solely on the dorsal fin being exceptionally large. They are black on the back with an elongated yellow band extending backwards from the upper edge of a long white oval base. So we can see the oval base, the yellow band, and then we've got a gray patch here. We've then got our killer whale or orca. So the male's dorsal fin um, can be up to two meters large. They do have a very large, very distinct dorsal fin, which makes them quite easily identify and identifiable. Their body is black with a white saddle patch and white eye patches. Again, makes them a bit more easy to identify. And of course, they are the largest dolphin species. Next up, we have our long finned pilot whale. I personally think this photo over here is horrific and quite terrifying. Um, but they are quite cool animals. They have a square bulbous head, which we can see from this bottom photo, which is more prominent in older males and a slightly protruding upper lip. They have a low long base dorsal fin, which is not too clear from these photos. Um, it does point backwards and it's slightly forward of the center of the back. So not quite the center, just a little bit in front of that. They are black or dark gray in the head and the back is grayish with a white anchor shaped patch on the chin, which we can see down here, and a gray area on the belly. So there's another clear image of the anchor shaped white patch over there. So next up we have our sperm whale and striped dolphin. And um, we've got these together because we don't have too many photos of them. 
Firstly, the sperm whale has a huge square head and an underslung lower jaw, quite distinctive. They are a massive species, so we do have it in comparison to a diver as well as an elephant. They have a distinct triangular fin or dorsal hump two thirds along the body. So that is the fin there, otherwise known as the dorsal hump. We've then got our striped dolphin. They have a tapering forehead with a distinct groove, which we can just about see in this photo. They have a distinctive white or light gray V shape from above and behind the eye, which we can see over here, with one um, finger narrowing to point below the fin, which we can see over here. Um, and one lower one extending towards the tail. So we can see how this divides into two different parts. Two black lines extending from the eye backwards along the flank. So we can see that's one big line, one black line even, and another black line over there. So this has all gone a lot faster than I expected. But what we have next is just a couple of images of um, different species. And we're just gonna ask you guys to identify them if you're able to, um, if you can just pop your answers in the chat, then we can take it from there. So this is our first species we have. So I'll give you a, a couple minutes. Yeah. So we've got killer whale, orca. Simon and Fiona. Jane, Paul, right? Yeah, yeah, awesome. And we started nice and easy. Next up, we've got these guys. Awesome, yeah, common dolphins. Um, they're quite easy to do, distinguish from the size, the coloring, as well as their long rostrum. Then we've got, so we'll add an extra um, part to this question. What age category do we think the second, the smaller dolphin is? Um, so the smaller dolphin, what age category would we say it's juvenile, calf, or newborn? Yeah, so I would say this is mother and newborn. Um, we can see the newborn is surfacing quite closely to the mother. And yes, they are bottlenose dolphins. Then we've got... <laughs> Humpy, I like that. Yeah, humpback whale, again, quite distinctive from the color on its pectoral fins. This is our next one. Yeah, yeah it is a Rissos dolphin. And we can see by the quite large dorsal fin as well as the white scarring on the body of the animals. My picture is not the best of quality, so I do apologize. <laughs> yes, hub, porpoise, or puffing pig, whichever one you're going for. That's all right. And we got this one.
Yeah, so this one is a slightly more challenging species we don't see as often as the other ones. Um, it is an Atlantic white-sided, so we can see based on the coloration, um, the yellow, the white and the gray, as well as their small rostrum. And this one I haven't really given you too much to go off on um just the the dorsal fin itself yes that that is a minky whale again not the best of photos um but that's more likely what you're going to see during your watches rather than excellent views like that so that is it for now um if you have any questions feel free to pop them in the chat um and we can answer them and before we carry on so if you think of questions in the meantime it's just a few things you want to make you aware of for next week. Um, we do have a few online events running. Um, first one being on the 27th of July, that's on Wednesday, which is an online art workshop, um, which is being run by Mapping Ocean Change through art. So the whole point of this is to create um, ecosystem collages based on the food chain and migration route, connections of marine species between the UK and Arctic. So this is being run by an artist called Jen Argo. She's really fantastic. Um, and you can either get involved with this by doing your collage with paper, so magazines, newspapers, et cetera, or you can do it on the computer. Is there an app that you say there was? Uh, she said you can download Photoshop. Okay, if you can yeah. download Photoshop, Canva, or things like that, yeah. um, you are able to do it on the computer if you do find that easier. Uh, all the information is on the website though, if you're interested in that, and you can sign up to join us on Wednesday. Then on Thursday the 28th, we have an evening with Sea-Watch. This is going to be run by our research assistant, um, Rebecca, and she's going to go through some of, or through some of her background um, and her experience with Sea-Watch. We're also going to have one of our interns speaking, Celia, um, and she'll be showing you some of her incredible photographs that she's taken while she's been with us. She'll also be explaining about her experience with Sea-Watch um, and a bit about Cardigan Bay itself. Um, Celia has been with us for two periods now and she will be staying on for a third. So she has got a lot of experience with Sea-Watch um, and her passion is honestly incredible. We will also be having a representative from NRW, Natural Resources Wales, who will be showing or telling us a bit more about the work that they do and how important it is to get out in nature to improve your mental health and how getting involved with events such as National Whale and Dolphin Watch do help you, um, especially coming out of lockdowns. And so yeah, just essentially talking about how it's really great to get out there and get involved with these things. And lastly, we'll have a question session with our monitoring officer, Katrin. So you're more than welcome to send questions on the night or you're welcome to send questions in before um, and she can prepare answers for you. But yes, as Katie said, these are all available on the website. Um, so if you are interested, do register the same way you registered for this talk tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some questions. Yeah. Yes, I believe we are fully indemnified for insurance risk assessments. Um, I can double check this with Peter and get him to send through the documents for that. Um, so if you just send us through your email address, um, either to National Whale and Dolphin Watch email address or to myself, and we can um, sort that out for you. So anyone up in Moray Firth like to meet up and do a watch together? I wish I could. Um, we're in Newquay, obviously, I don't know if anyone else on. Mm -hmm. there oh, we watches, do. Yeah. Cool. So there are watches going on. Um, so that's that is exciting. Again, you can find the watches on the website um, and they will tell you all about the locations, the dates, the times so you can get involved that way. I think those are the questions. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, if you have any more questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat or to email us and we can get in touch that way. Yeah, should we leave it for a little bit? Okay. Yeah, well, guys, I'm more than welcome to go. Um, recording to you, so. Pardon? The recording, so. Yes, we can send the recording through to you. Um, if you are able to just drop us your emails, we can get that to you as soon as possible. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you so, so much for volunteering. Um, it really, really helped us and really helps us to carry on doing the work we're doing. Um, so please do keep getting involved. We really appreciate all you're doing.
and we look forward to hearing from you and hearing how the watches go. Um, so do stay in touch. Thank you very much. Lost how to.